All right, here we are at the uh, Red Oak Covered Bridge. We're talking with uh, Bruce O'Neill, and um, the, the historical significance of this bridge here is that it's the longest covered bridge, wooden covered bridge in Georgia. And I guess another really great historical fact is that it was uh, built by a, nam a man by the name of uh, Horace King. That's correct. Um, tell us a little bit about Horace King and who he was historically. Horace King was a, a gentleman that picked up this trade from his master uh, by working with him so many years and all. And his master got old <clears throat> and he had learned enough about the trades that he was a master carpenter and he built a lot of these covered bridges all over the southeast in Georgia and Alabama mostly. And uh, he was uh, kind of a mixed race. He was uh, a third uh, black. He was a third white and a third Indian, mm -hmm. and uh, but he was very skilled at what he did. And uh, once the word got around it, <clears throat> how skilled he was, different states and different counties contracted with him to uh, build these bridges. Back then, there wasn't a whole lot of steel in the United States, and all they had to build them out of was heart pine. And uh, he got very skilled at it, so. As he went along and built these bridges, his reputation preceded him. <clears throat> and as soon as he get through building one, there was a line of people waiting for him to build them in this part of Georgia all over. And uh, these bridges were well needed. The communi only communications and uh, way of traveling back then was either by horseback. And this was around 1840, 20-something uh, years before the Civil War. Either wagon, covered wagon, or horseback. So these bridges were very, very valuable. And this was farming area in here to get the product to town, to get the meal or the corn to the mill so they could grind it to make flour, <clears throat> so they'd have flour to, for food, you know. So these bridges were very, very important to the farmers in this area. Yeah, and it, it stands to a testament to uh, his engineering capabilities because pretty much the majority of this bridge is still original. That's right. Yeah, there's probably 90-95% of this bridge is still original. We put a new roof on it, but uh, his engineering skills was uh, very, very good for that period of time, you know, and uh, there just wasn't many skilled carpenters that could build these bridges. So he, w he was known throughout the southeastern United States for his skill and his talent, and uh, he had a lot of people waiting, and a lot of city governments, county governments, as fast as he could build them, another one just showed up, you know, and he did that his whole entire life. And I'm looking at the style of this bridge, and being from New England, um, this looks like it was just picked up out of New England and dropped down here in Georgia. Is, is, is it true that Horace went up to New England, I think it was Connecticut, and studied uh, bridge building? He did. When he worked for his master, that uh, taught him his trade, he had a chance to travel and go to school and pick up experiences from different places before he came down here. And I think this bridge is called a Town and Lattice mm -hmm. Bridge. It has 2,500 uh, two-inch pegs in it, wooden pegs, no nails in it whatsoever. It's all put together with uh, pegs. And if you go under this bridge and look, there's not a superstructure under this bridge. The, the bridge picks up all its strengths out of those uh, Town and Lattice wide boards from the inside of it. Very, very, very steady. This bridge has been here for hundreds of years, and it stood, withstood a lot of floods. So it's a, it's a superstructure for the period of time it was built. And as you were saying, his uh, bridge engineering and building skills were such demand in the South. Of course, being the 1840s and before the Civil War, I mean, slavery was still instituted, but he was able to uh, purchase his freedom, and then I think... Uh, there were some acts of uh, state congress in Alabama or something like that, so he could f travel freely. He could travel f freely. Uh, his skill was, was so noted and so respected by people from Georgia and Alabama that they gave him his freedom. Uh, he bought his freedom by working uh, for these intergovernment agreements on these bridges. So he was able to move freely. And this was 20 years before slavery ended. But, uh, so tell me about the uh, the whole, how you got involved in preserving this bridge. Well, I'm a native of Merrittweather County. I was born here. 
And uh, actually, my great great grandfather came to Meriwether County on a covered bridge. I mean, a covered wagon. Uh, I think it was uh, 1828 and settled in uh, Meriwether County, which this was Troop County then, but later on it became Meriwether County. And uh, so we've been here for generations, a lot of generations, you know, a lot of history. This bridge was built right after that. My great-great-grandfather was here before the bridge was ever built. And I don't really know. We don't have any way to prove it and all. He probably met Horace King in his rounds, you know, because he lived right here all these years. But I've always lived here and respected the bridges and uh, tried to preserve them, try to keep people from burning them up, try to keep them from doing uh, different type devilment on them. Yeah, you were telling me earlier that one of the biggest headaches, I guess you could say, you have is keeping the graffiti off the bridge. That's right. Keeping the graffiti and the paint off of it and people carving on it. And the carving is not as bad as the graffiti, but at different times, they've, they've had several gallons of paint in there. Different colors would come down here and they have a party at night and paint them all up and it'd take us a month or two to clean it up, but it looks original right now, you know. And uh, the last two or three years, we have sparked a lot of interest in different people from the county. Uh, they help us. We, we keep vigilance on it all the time. There's somebody down here every weekend, off and on, all during the day and all. So we got so many people helping look after it. Maybe we can preserve it for future generations since it's still in real good shape. And it's one of the only few bridges still in the state of Georgia that has live traffic on it. You know, most of them's got a bypass on them. And, uh, you can still go and visit and look at them and all, but this one's actually got live traffic on it. And it's had live traffic on it since the date was built. And we'd like to keep it that way as long as we could. Now, is there any sort of um, fund that's set up for the bridge where people can donate either money or time to help preserve it? Not at this time, but we are working to strive to get in, get in that situation. We got uh, different groups, specific groups that helps us look after it visually and uh, volunteers that come down and volunteer their time to help keep it clean, help keep trash picked up. And uh, right here lately, we have put these picnic tables in here and trash cans and all. We have a lot of visitors during the summer months and uh, it just kind of adds to the recreation. You know, people with families can come down, sit down and uh, have a picnic dinner and uh, enjoy the scenery, enjoy the bridge. Yeah, and we just had a cold snap here in Georgia and a lot of folks getting out and enjoying the weather today. There's actually quite a bit of folks down here today yes. in, in February checking yes. out this bridge. Um, <clears throat> there's some other bridges that uh, covered bridges in the area that have since been destroyed or burned down and you're in the process of, uh, you were telling me, yeah, uh, we, rebuilding one of them. Tell us about that bridge that, that's in the process of being rebuilt. Okay, um, this this particular covered bridge here is on Red Oak Creek in Emelac, Georgia, about three miles north of Woodbury. We had another bridge uh, in the north end of the county on White Oak Creek. And about 25 or 30 years ago, uh, vandals burned the bridge. And uh, people still talk about this day and time. We never really found out who vandalized it and burned it, you know, but it, it's a lot of history gone away in just an hour's time. So people in this area are still upset about that happening. And that's why we have people down here day and night. The deputies, sheriff's department does hourly patrols on the weekends down here to kind of help keep down the traffic. People that would do damage to the bridge and uh, different specific, specific clubs that helps uh, watch on the weekends and the holidays. And at different times, there's, there's 50, 100 people down here during the summer months. And a lot of people come from long ways off just to film this bridge. This is probably the most film covered bridge in, in the state of Georgia. And you really have to be down here on a warm day in the summer to realize the traffic be backed up all the way to the top of the hill, just people enjoying it, walking through it. And, talking about the history and taking pictures of it. And if you ride around Meriwether County, we got a lot of little gift shops and uh, antique places around the county. Every one of them's got 50 or 100 pictures of this bridge in it, you know. And so, during the uh, Cotton Picking Festival in Gay, uh, I know there were busing folks out here. That's right. Just about every hour on the hour. That's right. Um, Going back and talking a little bit more about some of the history of this bridge in, in recent times, uh, going back to 1994, this river here, Red Oak Creek, uh, joins the Flint River. And of course, there was that big flood along the Flint River Basin back in 94 mm. that this bridge survived. And you were showing me a part of the bridge that was 
kind of bowed or warped where all the pressure of that water was just kind of pushing against this bridge. Uh, talk to us about uh, that, that time and the concern that this bridge would be washed away, but you know, obviously it's still here. Right. In 1994, we had some severe rains in Meriwether County, in this part of Georgia really, all the way from North Georgia, slept on down to the Florida line, up and down Flint River. And it rained for two weeks, day and night. And the water got over the top of just about every bridge in Meriwether County. Hundreds of bridges were underwater from anywhere from seven days to 14 days. This particular bridge right here, the water got up about three quarters of the way to the top of the bridge. And the water's real forceful right in this area because it's kind of downhill, a lot of pressure against the north side of the bridge. Uh, we expected the bridge actually to be washed away. But it survived all of that water. And there was hundreds of people came down here every day from both sides, from the Pike County side and the Meriwether side, just to watch the bridge and take a last look at it and take pictures of it, just knowing it was going to be gone any day. But somehow or another, uh, the bridge survived that storm and all that water and still here today. The north side of the bridge is bowed in just a little bit. If you look down the side of it, where all the water pressure, it hit against it. But there wasn't any damage done other than that. And it's it, still here today. So we blessed with that. And then again, there was another flood in 2004 where it, it looked pretty dicey. 2004, the water got up in it. It didn't stay as long, but the water got up about halfway of the covered bridge. And it was almost as bad as the first flood, but it was only in this area. I could find it this county and a couple of counties below that wasn't statewide. But the water did get real deep on it. So we had two, two massive floods just a few years apart. And uh, Horse King built this bridge and I know they didn't expect to have any. They call it a hundred year flood. Didn't expect it to have to survive uh, torrential rains and uh, high water like that. But it goes back to the engineering feat that he had and the skill and talent he had when he built this bridge. Uh, just for instance, in uh, 2004, I was public works director then. Wasn't any damage did to this bridge, but we had 37 steel structure bridges in the same area washed out the same night. So I guess you could say uh, the wooden this wooden bridge was engineered so well that it withstood the flood and a lot of the modern day steel and cement bridges was washed away. Hmm. Um, let, let's talk about this area in and of itself, some of the history here. I know the Red, Red Oak Creek joins the Flint River and not too far from here, just a couple miles, is uh, uh, Flat Creek, Flat, Sho uh, Flat Shoals on the uh, Flint River. Um, what's the historical significance of, of, of this kind of area in, in the whole? Well, this area primarily has always been farming. And, uh, before the white man came to this part of the country, this was all Indians in here. And there was numerous Indian tribes on every creek and river up here because it was so the wildlife and the fish was so plentiful that every 10 or 15 miles there was a different uh, Indian village in this area. Uh, Flat Shoals, Flint River is a very, very deep river all the way from the south side of Atlanta all the way down to Florida line, very deep. There's only one or two places you can cross Flint River on horseback or walking or in covered uh, wagons. And the reason for that is because of the depth, depth of the river. However, in this area, there's a wide section in the river. It's about a half a mile wide and it's all solid rock. The formation of rock crosses the river. The river's so wide that it's not deep when it runs over the rocks. It's real shallow. And uh, most of the time in the summer months, it's not over 12 to 14 inches deep. Because it was so wide, the water has room to spread out, you know, it just hadn't got the depth there. So all the Indians have crossed there for thousands of years. And when white men first started selling this part of the country, the Indians showed them where they could cross the river, the trail, with their wagons, you know, because it is real wide and real deep everywhere else. And uh, it became one of the major routes in this part of Georgia for people that was going west. And, uh, Later on, they built a, a wooden structure bridge there. It wasn't a covered bridge like this, but it was a thousand foot wooden bridge that people used for years and years, and they finally took it down and built a cement bridge there. But uh, that's a little bit of the history in this area. And this particular bridge right here 
about 300 yards north of it is the old weir, or uh, what we call in this part of the country a fish trap. The Indians had a fish trap here on this creek, and when the game wasn't real plentiful, they had to rely on fish for a living. So what they did is gathered stones all over the fields and all they made a rock dam across the creek. And the dam's about 12 foot high and the fish could not move freely up and down the creek. And on one side of this weir, a fish trap, they built a wooden trap about 10 foot wide to trap the fish. And as the fish moved up and down the creek, they was trapped in that, in that weir and uh, the engine fished it for years and years and years. And uh, that's the way they survived when the game was poor or plentiful or game moved in other areas, you know, they relied on fish for the living. So there is a lot of history and all in this area, you know. However, it's been farming all of my life, you know. Um, all through the 40s, 50s, and 60s, it was, we farmed cotton, you know. And after the cotton went out, we farmed some soybeans and corn, and then we raised cattle for the last 30 years. And then cattle's kind of phase, halfway phasing out now. And the growing crop right now is uh, pine trees. Everybody's planting the land in pine trees, you know. So it's it's changed over the years from from different uh, type farming, you know, but it's all related to farming uh, in some way. So, yeah. And speaking about pine trees, um, the final segment here. I just want to talk about the specific construction of this bridge. Right. Um, you're looking at the bridge in the background. You can see some light spots. You can see some dark spots. And you were telling me any of that wood that's that's darker in color is original, uh, virgin longleaf pine. And then uh, That's those, correct. those uh, lighter boards are, are some pine boards that you put up. Tell us about the, the wood and the construction of the bridge. Okay, the, the original bridge is made out of longleaf pine. It grew on the mountains about uh, five, six miles south of here. And it's heart pine. It never has to be painted and it won't ever rot. It resists insects. It resists the sun. It resists the rain. So it's real, real durable. So the death choice of wood in this area was hard pine and you can't find a better wood to build a bridge out of for longevity. Uh, the light board you see on the side of the bri this bridge about 25 or 30 years ago we had some vandals come down here and have a party one night and uh, they all got drunk and they began kicking the bridge uh, the boards off the bridge on the inside and the water was high and all the boards they kicked off all of the light boards you see right there was kicked off into the water and before daylight, all of them had floated down to the river and we wasn't able to find but just a few of them. So it, 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 the bridge looked so bad, I worked at a high-tech sawmill for 30 years, Mead West Vaco, and they allowed me to have some heart pine uh, logs that was too big for the mill. We sawed boards and donated them to Merriweather County and put all those light boards back on there. And they're a little bit different in the coloration, you know, but they, they matched up very close, you know, and that's the story on that. From time to time, we do have some vandalism on it, you know, and that's why we're so vigilant over it and so protective over it right now that we don't want anything to happen. We want to stay here another 200 years and people will be able to enjoy it and film it.